Hey there guys, 2023 is probably going to go down and history books is one of my best years of fishing I've ever had in my life. Like the world reopened after COVID and Sidra's health bounced back after her surgery enough that we were able to get out and explore and have some great fishing adventures both domestically here in the United States, but also uh, many of them abroad. So I thought I'd share with you my top 10 catches of 2023 and talk a little bit about those experiences and some of the gear and culture that we experienced fishing both here and abroad. All right, let's get started. First up is gonna be shirozake, which is the Japanese word for chum salmon. Uh, we went to Hokkaido uh, during the fall, during the peak of the chum salmon run, and it's actually illegal to target chum salmon in freshwater systems in Japan, so everybody targets them along the coast, generally around uh, river mouths where they come into the ocean there, and they fish for them in heavy surf, and it's big, shallow surf that extends out. So they use these really bizarre rigs. They use a very heavy float here that's, you know, as big as like our one and a half, two ounce floats, and then below it, they run a really heavy uh, spoon that's like one to two ounces with a hoochie that has two hooks on it. Now, sometimes they'll tip the uh, hooks with some shrimp or mackerel, uh, but you know, I've tried that when I was there, but honestly, I caught all of mine just on the bare hoochie. And this spoon is heavy. It weighs about one to two ounces. And you see how short the leader is and the bobber is fixed. And um, basically this lets you, you cast out into the surf and you just slow retrieve this and this heavy spoon wobbles back through the waves and the surf. And you would see the chum salmon come up in the waves and attack your gear. And I ended up catching, I hooked four um, and landed three in the heavy surf. And Sidra got one, but she also lost it in the surf. Uh, but yeah, it was, we tried North American techniques that we would normally use in Puget Sound, like uh, marabou jigs under a float, and we just couldn't get any bites. But the Japanese really have it dialed in with this really interesting uh, chum salmon float rig using heavy spoons. I really would like to try it in the United States here, but we don't really have an equivalent of uh, surf fishing for chum opportunity at least not here in washington uh, maybe if i get up to alaska i'll be able to give this uh, rig a try but really super cool and it was a ton of fun number nine on the list so we're going to start from the bottom and work our way up number one number nine on this was a trip over to baker lake to fish for sockeye salmon now i've always put this fishery off because i literally have sockeye salmon like hundreds of thousands of them in my backyard every year so it's really hard to justify that long drive uh, through the mountains, but I'm so glad that I did it this year. Um, it was great to be over there. The fish were really big this year and the bite was pretty good, especially early in the season. And uh, the scenery is of course, absolutely stunning with Mount Baker towering over that beautiful mountain lake. And I got to meet a ton of my subscribers. It was really fun to be out there. I kind of struggled the first day, but I went back out the next day and really started to get it dialed in. And for sure, uh, there's no better eating fish in Washington State than Baker Lake sockeye salmon. I mean, I those things were amazing on the grill. I froze them, and then we had them uh, as pokey and sashimi, and they were just so bright red, firm and fatty, and just oh, so so amazing. Just the most delicious fish, you know. There, um, I did really well on just plain pink hoochies behind a dodger. Uh, I really struggled with like the the gear that I was having great success with here. Uh, here they were hitting spinners um, almost exclusively, and over there they were hitting hoochies. So you just never know. That's what's really cool. But man, if you've never done that Baker Lake sockeye fishery, you are missing out. It's so much fun. There's tons of campgrounds all around the lake. I was really fortunate uh, to be invited over by another YouTuber, uh, Sea Wolf Fishing. She's an awesome uh, lady. She's a great kayak angler very knowledgeable biologist and she, and she's the queen of kayak squidding for sure. Number eight on this list, we're gonna flip back to Japan. Uh, we went to a big ancient caldera lake in the northern part of the island of Hokkaido. Uh, this lake is called Lake Kusharo and it's one of the few lakes that has uh, a fall kokanee fishery. So kokanee, uh, which they call himemasu, are, uh, are native to Japan. They even have a endemic species of kokanee that lives at extreme depths and spawns at extreme depths. It's called the black kokanee. It has no red pigment at all, but those are protected and they're on the, the bigger island to the south of Honshu where, where Tokyo is. But 
Uh, this lake was just stunning. Of course, like I said, it's a caldera lake. Um, not unlike our crater lake in Oregon, just much bigger. Um, it even has an island in it for the, from the last eruption, a little cinder cone that sticks up out there. And what's cool about this lake is that uh, it's a shore spawning kokanee populations and there's all these uh, springs that run along the western shore of the lake and it's very popular for uh, Japanese anglers to participate in this. But those kokanee stage up and spawn all along that western shore. Um, there's some of those springs are even geothermal so when you're walking the shoreline and fishing um, you you're all of a sudden you'll go from being in like 55 60 degree water to like standing in like 100 degree water like bubbling up underneath your feet it's so strange really bizarre but all of that geothermal energy and those geothermal springs they're pumping tons of phosphorus into that lake which is why a lot of the lakes kokanee lakes in japan they don't get very big uh, but here, you know, a lot of the fish were in that 15, 16 inch range. We even saw some big spawners that were well above 20 inches. I just couldn't get them to bite. And it was interesting because we were oftentimes fishing uh, around lots of other Japanese anglers. And uh, they were, for the most part, really polite and fun to interact with. Uh, they all had their bear bells on because there's uh, brown bear, like grizzly bears, um, like our grizzly bear. Uh, they're all over Hokkaido. There's like 10,000 on the island. And we did see some in the north uh, that were eating chum salmon. Uh, but yeah, it was really fun. And all the Japanese anglers are like throwing little spinners and spoons and uh, jerk baits. And I did get one on a jerk bait, but I actually found really great success just using pink crappie tube jigs underneath a float. I tipped it with uh, gulp maggots and we just cast it into those staged up schools and you'd see that little bobber sink and you'd set the hook. Um, it was so much fun on ultralight. We did it a couple days in a row. Both times I got, you know, four to six fish each each time. And uh, the coloration was a little bit different. They're a little bit greener. Um, they have a more of a green stripe down the side um, in, in their spawning colors than our fish. Um, so there's probably a little bit of a speciation going on there. But yeah, really cool, great experience. And uh, you didn't even need a boat. Like you can just catch a kokanee right there from shore. So that was awesome. Number seven was something that after my Kokanee Across America tour I did last year, I knew I was gonna go back and do again and bring Sidra, and that is I went to the land of Kokanee of unusual size. And when I'm talking about the Kokanee of unusual size, you know I'm talking about Wyoming and Fontenelle. Absolutely fell in love with that lake. Uh, last year when catching these massive Kokanee flatlined or basically very near surface um, in this big sagebrush sea, those fish fight so hard and they're just thick. They're the thickest kokanee I've seen. And you know, the average there is like 17 to 18 inches. And you, I always caught a couple 20s uh, when I went out last year. And this year was no different. We got there, we were actually quite, we were a little bit accosted by somebody, one of the locals at the boat ramp saying that the fishery had declined and it was because I'd put it on the map, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, we went out and had a spectacular day, uh, just absolutely slaying these giant kokanee. We fished, you know, less than half a day, and uh, I caught, you know, all but one fish short of my limit. Sidra got into some absolute tanks, and that's what I really wanted to see was, you know, for years, Sidra hasn't been able to get out and kayak fish with me because of her endometriosis, but with that successful surgery, she got out there and she was a champ. I mean, she was doing such a great job um, handling those big kokanee and netting them. She does a better job netting them than I do. Uh, but yeah, just a ton of fun. And, you know, there's a lot of other lakes in Wyoming that have big kokanee. I'm starting to think that Wyoming might be the epicenter of giant kokanee in, in the United States. It seems like they've really got their kokanee fisheries dialed in. Doesn't mean you're going to go out there and catch 100 fish, but a lot of the fish you catch are going to be really big and of course, delicious. Number six, uh, we're going back to Hokkaido again. Seems like we're bouncing back and forth between Japan and the United States right now. And uh, this species is one that I actually uh, had anticipated only targeting the landlocked version of it, but it's cherry salmon. So a lot of people have never even heard of cherry salmon. You know, here in North America, we've got a suite of awesome salmon species to target, sockeye, coho, chum, kings. But East Asia has its own unique set of salmon too. There's some overlap, uh, but uh, they have these cherry salmon. They look like a weird cross between like a coho salmon and a chum salmon. Their coloration, they have that really strong hooked beak, 
like a coho, and then they have the barring, the tiger stripes, the vertical tiger stripes like a chum salmon, but those colors, instead of having purples, they got uh, reds and greens and yellows, and they're very beautiful. They're widespread. They're like a spring-summer run salmon, so those salmon move up into uh, coastal rivers and Hokkaido and uh, into the islands to the south. And uh, they spend most of the summer kind of hanging out in the river systems, and then they spawn in the fall. So when we were there, they spawn in the fall. But what's interesting about cherry salmon is um, they also will quickly revert to landlocked form in lakes, and some of the males will naturalize into freshwater forms in the coastal rivers. Um, they're almost like jacks, but except they just look like par. They maintain their par-like markings, but they become stream resident, and yet they can still breed with the sea run fish. And so what's really cool is you can catch all these different types of landlocked cherry salmon, sea run cherry salmon, and then the, the resident cherry uh, river salmon, which they call cherry trout. Um, and I caught all of those. Uh, it's actually illegal to target the, the sea run fish in the river systems, but they're a common bycatch when you're targeting the native char, rainbow trout, and brown trout that live in those river systems too. Also when you're fishing for cherry trout, because you'll find those cherry trout, the males, hanging out around those female uh, cherry salmon looking to sneak in there because they look just like a, a, a par. and. Um, it, the, the bigger sea run males just don't recognize them as a threat, but they're actually sexually mature and kind of sneakily getting in there and getting in some action with those bigger hens. So very cool to, to interact with this species. I caught landlocked uh, versions in lakes. So it's much like our landlocked uh, uh, sockeye, kokanee, or landlocked coho fisheries that we have here in the Northwest. So just a really cool experience to interact with that species in lots of different um, evolutionary uh, units, you know, it was really cool. For number five, we're going to jump to the south of Japan and go to the country of Thailand. And um, as many of you know who watch my channel, I really love small stream fishing. It's one of the things I enjoy most during the summertime when it's hot. I like to go out there and wet wade in the streams and just catch bountiful numbers of little trout. And I use a Tenkara rod for that because you don't really need a reel when you're fighting these smaller fish and really tight cover on these streams. And uh, I really wanted to target a species of fish called blue masir. Now, masir are actually in the carp family or minnow family, and they occupy really clean, pristine streams in southeastern Asia. And I didn't know if I was really going to be able to find them in Thailand. I know a lot of their habitat's been uh, destroyed, um, but we started exploring some of the remote areas up on its border with Myanmar and the northwest of the country and we found these beautiful river systems and small limestone streams that were just aquamarine blue with cascading waterfalls everywhere and in every pool there's just tons of masir and uh, we found a couple of nice pools where I was able to coax several fish into taking uh, large stoneflies uh, but it's like once you'd catch one or two fish out of a pool that was it like they were just not going to give all the rest of the fish weren't going to give you the time of day but such a cool experience to connect with these fish in a really unique and beautiful landscape and just really stunning waters. Um, I just really enjoy just exploring the streams and looking down and seeing the masir swimming around in the in the really clear water. It made it really hard to approach them though because they were just so spooky. It's like once they saw you, they would not be interested in, in biting anything. So definitely one of the highlights of this year's fishing trips. For number four, we're going to stay in the country of Thailand. And ever since I was a little kid, I, I used to you know, get National Geographic and zoo books and all that stuff. And I always wanted to catch a Mekong catfish. Now, unfortunately, in the wild, Mekong catfish have been decimated through um, overharvest and habitat destruction, and it's illegal to target them in the wild anymore. In fact, there's probably only a few hundred fish that probably persist on the Mekong River itself, but uh, the Thai people have figured out how to raise these fish in hatcheries, and then they uh, take those hatchery fish and plant them in reservoirs throughout the country to provide a limited uh, commercial harvest for those fish. But they also sell the surplus to like pay ponds, so they stock these ponds all around the country. We'll stock them with Mekong catfish. 
and you can come pay a fee and you can fish for them using uh, basically dough balls. What they gave us was like this weird mixture of like, it looked like old donuts. <laughs> it might have been old donuts and like f fermented fruits like pineapple and other things. And it's all just kind of mixed up in there. And uh, you let it f ferment in that bag and then you can squeeze it onto a bait cage, which is like a big, like a chum cage. And then below that you run your hook with a harder dough bait which stays on so you cast out that chum cage kind of creates a chum cloud that brings the fish in they find that hard dough bait that stays on the hook a little bit better and they gnaw on that thing and then you can set the hook i really wanted to catch this fish and this was like the only way i could ethically do it and i have no regrets about it. it's one of the funnest days i've had uh, in a long time we were just sitting there catching fish after fish some of these fish were upwards of you know probably in the 60 70 pound range and we just caught fish in the 30 to 40 pound range like all day like fish after fish it was crazy like we were just exhausted after spending the day there and it was so much fun it really didn't cost that much it was and the equipment was absolutely lousy and terrible but it was still one of the, one of the funnest times i've ever had a uh, catfish and it's not often you get to go catfishing and just catch fish after fish after fish so pretty cool number three we're still staying in the country of thailand and this was one of the fish that was on my bucket list so several years ago I almost uh, checked out of this planet uh, thanks to flu followed by a double lung pneumonia infection, bilateral pneumonia. Then I went and got septicemia. So I spent uh, quite a bit of time in hospital that year and I had a long road to recovery after my lungs were decimated. And I remember lying in the hospital bed. I, was, I wrote down a list of six fish I wanted to catch before I died. And I was going to get started on that right after I got better. Um, and then COVID hit and like everything, the world is shut down. So it just seemed like a bad time. But I, this year I was like, I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to try and check off three of those six fish in one year. And Giant Snakehead was one of them. So we rented a floating uh, cabin, which was super cheap. It was like, I think it, we paid a little over like $150 for a night, which is crazy expensive for Thailand. But that included all your meals. We had an, our own cabin with our own like two people attending to us and all the food, the food was amazing. It was a really spectacular experience. And so the first day we got there, we got settled in, they had kayaks for us. We took the kayaks out and we were throwing frogs for the uh, top water for the snakehead. It's really not the best time to target them because we went there in the winter time and they actually get more active when it's hot. Even though it was hot for us, it was cold for snakeheads. And so we found they were only bite in the evenings when it was warmest. And uh, on that first evening, we went out and I uh, caught a really nice fish, stunning like purples and blacks, and it's just a absolutely beautiful and toothy fish. Uh, but I was so thrilled to be able to do that without a guide, like totally on our own. And I ended up catching several more smaller ones, but that first one I caught, that was the prettiest one, uh, was so much fun. All of them I caught were on either frogs or jerk baits. And uh, Sidra caught a little one on a frog. She had a lot of missed blowups. It really frustrated her. Uh, but yeah, it was still really fun to be there. And you, we could hear like wild peacocks in the forest around us and stuff. We had a, a great trip uh, there in Northern Thailand fishing for giant snakehead. Okay, number two, we're gonna jump back north to Japan where we went to Hokkaido in the fall. And uh, this was another one of those bucket list species. and. I've always wanted to catch a taiman or taiman. Um, everybody knows about taiman from Mongolia, and that's a very challenging country to travel in and self guide for fishing. Uh, it's actually required that you have a guide when fishing in Mongolia. It's actually illegal to go uh, fishing uh, without a guide, and all of the trips. Uh, this year, there was only once did we actually use a guide, and I'm grateful that we did do that. But I really uh, take a lot of pride in, in doing the research myself and going to these locations and catching fish without help of a guide. It's just so much more fulfilling to me. So I started looking into time and, and I know that uh, there is, uh, you can catch time on and, and they call them Ucho in Southeastern Europe too. Uh, but then I stumbled across uh, this species of time and called Sakhal and time and, and they actually live in Japan. And through my research, I discovered that um, you can target the sea run fish, but they're extremely rare and they start running in October and they run through the winter. Uh, but there is a landlocked population 
where those fish average five to eight pounds, which was plenty for me in the far northwest part of the country. And the name of this lake is Shumaranai. And Shumaranai has uh, this great campground built all around it. And it's like the place where all the Japanese anglers go to catch their taimon. And we talked to a lot of Japanese anglers uh, when we were doing the kokanee fishing. And we, you know, they, we told them about all the species we planned on targeting. And they always asked us, you're gonna go after Taimon? And I was like, oh yeah, we're going to Shumaranai. They're like, oh, you know about Shumaranai. And then I was like, have you been? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, how many have you caught? And they're like, um, none. <laughs> and I was like, oh. And several of the anglers we talked to had been up there multiple times and never caught a fish. So I knew I was gonna have to be really lucky if I was gonna get this fish. Um, so we get there, uh, we get settled into our campground. And while we're setting up a tent, there's a guy fishing on the bank, an older gentleman, um, and Japanese gentleman, and he hooks like a eight, nine pound taimon right there and lands it. And Cinder's like, oh, this is gonna be easy. They're right here in camp. And then like we fished all day. We fished that evening, nothing. We fished all day the next day, thousands of casts. We even brought our kayak. We traveled all around the lake. There was anglers everywhere and we never saw a fish caught. We never got a bite. Uh, it was terrifying. <laughs> like, I was like, oh man, uh, I only have a couple days to get this done. And so the next day, uh, we did the same thing. We fished all day, nothing. And uh, I was just fishing right from shore, right in front of our campsite, really close to where that gentleman had caught one before. And like the lake has really strict regulations on uh, fishing hours in part because there's a lot of brown bear in the area and there actually had been a fatality that spring where a bear had, had killed an angler who was shore fishing and uh, they wanted everybody back up off the shoreline you know before it got too dark and i had like three minutes of like legal fishing time left and i i was throwing a big heavy spinner and it just got absolutely clobbered and it was a time and, and when i hooked that thing Sidra was already up in camp trying to get uh, camp food ready i started screaming my head off every all the japanese campers came down and watched a lot of them were fishermen and um after a little bit of a rough net job we got that thing in the net and i was so relieved uh it was such a beautiful fish those stock holland time in they're the only sea run time in although this is a landlocked population um so they can do both they have this really ornate spotting. Um, they have that long snaky body like Taimon do and that huge blocky head. And they have a really beautiful like pink blush, almost like a rainbow trout with very fine spotting throughout the whole body. Uh, I just felt so privileged to and fortunate to have been able to connect with that species of fish. Um, it was amazing. And uh, the next day Sidra caught like a little tiny one from like the size of the spinner. That just shows how aggressive they are. Uh, but that was it and uh, we fished really hard the next full day and the next morning before a storm rolled in such a cool thing and another bucket list fish checked off um, and it was great i did it all without a guide so that was really awesome and then the number one fish for the year really surprises me because i really didn't anticipate this fishery being my favorite but there was a lot that made it really special and this is uh the wells catfish fishery on the rio ebro in northeastern Spain. Um, we always wanted to go to Spain, not only for the fishing, for the catfish, but also just for, for the birds. And I always wanted to do some hiking in the Pyrenees, which we got to do. But one of the major problems that we recognized once we got there is that Spain has been in this like decade long drought and the Rio Ebro, where we were gonna fish uh, around the region called Caspi, uh, was way down. like like 70, 80% down. So like most of the lake was just gone. It was just a creek when we got there. And I was like, oh my gosh, all my research had been based on when that lake was full. But we stayed at this place called Casa Rio, uh, which was a really lovely place run by a couple women from England who are amazing chefs and great hosts. If you're looking for a place to go and enjoy this fishery and amazing food and have a pool, um, this is the place. I loved it there. I loved our time there. Everything about it was awesome. But, you know, I, we talked to her on the phone and she said, you know, um, the river's really low. And I was really nervous about not being able to figure out the fishery, but she offered they, a guide who fishes out of a belly boat. 
and we had our kayak and he was like i'll just take you out and show you the spots and it was only for like 150 bucks for the day and then we had to pay for the bait which is night crawlers and uh, i thought you know what I've come this far i'm gonna make sure that i at least have uh some expert advice and i and then we had a couple uh days after that we were gonna fish the river without a guide so i was like he'll kind of give us the lowdown on where to and how to target these catfish but we got out there and it was really windy that day so i was really glad because he had a little trolling motor on his uh, belly boat so we were able to kind of like anchor to him and he could use his fins to kind of keep us in position but i didn't realize like how uh, complex this fishery was it's very simple in terms of rigs it's just a big giant pile like you put like a dozen worms on the hook and then um he uses this device called a clunk to like make a plunking noise on the water and the catfish get excited and it draws them up off the bottom and towards your baits and they come up and take it and for the first few hours of the day we've had lots of fish come up and i could even see them on my little garmin that i brought along that i had hanging off the side of the kayak they come up and they'd sniff those worms and they'd go back down and then uh finally we got one i got one to take and it was absolutely huge fish you know well over 100 pounds um just a monster fish and they, they fight amazing these wells catfish they're like they're all tail and like a head and uh they fight like that like they're incredible and sidra ended up hooking a massive seven foot long like 250 pound plus catfish um from our kayak and that thing just dragged us around like we were nothing it was such an amazing experience our guide was really cool super friendly this guy named pete um so if you ever want to go do this fishery you should definitely go uh out with pete and i would go out in his belly boats if i had known that the belly boat like was so much better for targeting this fish because you can really uh, hover and stay right on top of them and it looks like it's just as fun as fishing out of a kayak and he has those for rent um not expensive at all I would have done that. Uh, the next day we went out and we fished for Xander and things and then our kayak exploded. <laughs> um, so I didn't get to do a solo trip um, for those catfish, but I wasn't even upset because we had such a phenomenal day fishing for them. And of course, going back and having like the, the best food I've tasted in a long time. I'm usually disappointed by food when I go out to eat, but the food that uh, they make at Casa Rio is spectacular and just enjoying some red wine and delicious food after an awesome day of fishing was something that uh, i won't forget especially because i mean sidra was just riding so high after catching that giant fish it was an absolutely epic year of fishing and there's so many other experiences that i had to exclude that i couldn't even talk about but i'm really looking forward to 2024 not as much international stuff planned uh, but lots of exciting kokanee adventures here in the United States and Canada. I'm gonna go explore some new waters in Montana and gonna go back up to BC and hit some more lakes up there because uh, that Caribou region really is amazing. But I've got some adventures planned to target another one of those bucket list species in Greenland. And I'm really looking forward to that adventure too. So I look forward to taking you along with me uh, next year, and I appreciate all the support of my patrons, community members, and viewers who really make this adventurous life possible, and I really feel like I'm blessed um, to be able to do this. So anyways, I hope you guys have happy holidays and a good new year. And just remember, fish smarter, not harder. Bye, guys.